Okay, so hello and welcome everyone. So in this video, I'm going to talk about bargaining in the context of a simple bargaining game, which is really useful for thinking about negotiation. But it's also kind of a cool, kind of a cool example to illustrate some ideas from game theory. So let's consider the following bargaining process. Suppose we're starting with $150 or $150,000 or $150 million or whatever it is. And we've got this process where one person, one side, let's call them A, makes an offer, and then the other side, call them B, either accepts or rejects that offer. Now, if B accepts the offer, then the surplus, the $150, $150,000, $150 whatever it is, gets distributed according to A's offer. However, if B rejects, then we move on to round two, where B is able to make a counteroffer. But there's a catch. Going from round one to round two, the surplus is going to shrink. It goes, it reduces by a third, down to a hundred here. So now we only have a hundred dollars, hundred thousand, hundred million, whatever it is. So B is going to make an offer, and we're going to follow the exact same pattern now, reversed. So A has the opportunity to accept that offer, in which case the terms of the deal will be exactly as B proposes, or could reject. And if A rejects, then we go to round three. Round three, A will have a chance to revisit and make another offer. Except there's another there's a catch again. So the surplus falls down now two thirds from what the original was, right? So we'll have $50,000 or $50 million or just $50. And A is gonna make an offer that B is gonna accept or reject. If B accepts, well, the surplus is distributed according to how A has stipulated. If B rejects, they both get nothing, right? So if B rejects, they both get zero. Actually, in the last period of these games, we essentially have a take it or leave it ultimatum game. Anyway, so that gives us some clues into thinking about the solution, how this actually ought to, how this actually ought to play out. So the solution is, well, let's solve this thing by backward induction. So use some tools from game theory to work backwards to think of where, where the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium will be. The equilibrium in this game is actually for A to offer $100 to themselves and $50 to B. And as part of the equilibrium, we're assuming that, well, well we're concluding that B is going to be accepting immediately. Negotiation ought not actually go beyond the first round in equilibrium. So more generally, we have this result, and I'll talk about how we, how we get this result, but before I go any further, more generally, we have this result that if we have an even number of periods, we're gonna get a 50-50 split. Now watch for that as I'm doing this backward induction. When you get to period two, what's gonna be the proposal? 50-50 split. So it doesn't matter if I give, uh, if you have a problem where there's like two periods or four periods or 10 million periods, we're gonna, the theory's gonna predict a 50-50 split. Further, if there's an odd number of periods, we're gonna expect the division to be given by this following relationship. However, as the number of periods expands, we're gonna assume any first mover advantage is gonna deteriorate, and the division also approaches the 50-50 split. So here's the, here's the relationship between the number of periods and how the pi gets split up. So it's gonna be t plus one, where t is the number of periods, divided by two t. So in this example, we have t is equal to three, so we have three plus one is four, divided by six is two thirds. So two thirds of the surplus should go to person A. Sure, two thirds of 150 is, is 100, and then one minus two thirds, or one third, or one third of 150, which is 50, goes to person B, right? However, if the number of periods expanded, like suppose the number of periods was like 50, so then you end up having something that's gonna get much closer to a 50-50 split. Or suppose you have a thousand periods. So you can think about like, think back to calculus, think about like what happens as this tends to infinity. You can, you can do, um, uh, well, I don't know, like L'Hopital's rule or whatever. So anyway, so think about the backward induction solution here. In the last period, we essentially have an ultimatum game. So we have a take it or leave it or offer. And under those circumstances, person B who's responding to the last offer is gonna be exactly indifferent between accepting that offer, accepting a zero as part of that deal or getting a zero from rejecting. 
If that makes you uncomfortable, we could say, okay, A is going to give B just enough to sweeten the pie so that B is going to want to accept. So you could have some epsilon, some small positive amount. You could think of giving like a dollar or a penny. Theory would predict that that would be enough to be able to get B to accept. We're just going to dispense with that logic. If you want to, if you want to do it that way, cool. If not, we'll just assume that B is going to B is going to be exactly indifferent between this zero from A's offer or the zero they get from rejecting. So they're just going to accept, right? So I say A offers in the last period. A offers 50 to themselves, zero to B. And B is going to accept. They're going to get zero from accepting, which is just as good as from rejecting. Okay, so rolling back to period two, clearly if we can figure this out, we're expecting presumably B can as well. So B is gonna realize that they need to offer A at least $50, because otherwise A is gonna reject in period two, because A is gonna get their 50 in period three. So there was $100 available, B has to give A at least 50, and so B is gonna offer 50 to A, 50 to A and keep 50 for themselves. The second payoff goes to B. A will accept. Okay, well suppose not, let's just roll back to period period one. A would accept because they're exactly indifferent, just like B should accept here. Uh, so rolling back to period one, clearly A realizes that B is gonna get 50 either way, right? Because if A doesn't offer B 50 in the initial period, B is gonna reject, and then B is gonna get give an offer that involves 50 for themselves in the second period, A is gonna accept that because they're exactly indifferent between this 50 and the 50 they're gonna get later. So might as well just give B the 50 from the get-go. And this is what happens. A is gonna offer 100 to themselves and 50 to B, B is gonna accept. And that is the equilibrium. Matter of fact, the player should realize they should be able to kind of look forward and then look backwards in the game and realize that they can't improve upon this offer. And so this is an equilibrium. Person A is gonna offer $100, person B is gonna is gonna get 50 and accept, and the game is gonna end immediately. So, all right, that's a theoretical prediction, and I think that gives us some really good logic in a large number of cases. On average, I think a lot of behavior sort of converges to theory. That said, you can think of some other motivations that could enter. So for instance, and maybe you're thinking about this as I'm going over, as I'm going through this, well, what happens if we get to a situation where B actually doesn't think that zero from accepting is just as good as from rejecting. Maybe B is motivated by spite or uh, has uh, some interest in diminishing, some interest in taking this 50 away from A. We assume away all that stuff in, in the solution I just gave you. The solution I just gave you is just assuming standard economic assumptions, standard, um, standard sort of Nash equilibrium assumptions. Although if you wanted to build in some mathematical psychology or behavioral economics or something like that, yeah, clearly we'd get some other results. That's not what I'm, that's not what I'm presenting. That's not what, uh, that's not what the theory is doing. And so for instance, if I pose a question where I'm asking for the equilibrium, there we're assuming that B actually isn't motivated at all by any of those things, spite or anything. B is only interested in their own payoff. They're self-interested rational payoff maximizer and they're indifferent between zero here and zero from zero from accepting and zero from rejecting and that's the assumption we need to make moreover we're assuming that a is indifferent between the 50 in period three and the 50 in period two and we're assuming that b is moreover indifferent between the 50 they'd get in period two and the 50 they'd get in period one right even though yeah qualitatively there's some difference here because we've gone from a situation that's inequitable to a situation that's much more equitable by allowing this period to expire but we're assuming b's not motivated by inequity aversion or any of those other preferences of course like empirically if you're collecting data you could check to see how people actually behave that's an interesting exercise okay i'll go ahead and conclude here like and subscribe watch the video again all those fun things. See the relationship between this and the other game theory videos? I don't know. Do whatever you want.